Hold on. No, no, no. This is for you. My goodness. Uh, hey, uh, I am so grateful. I, we had a, a huddle backstage before our service started. And um, we said, God, for the six people that are showing up today, we just hope you show up with them. And uh, look at you guys. My goodness. It, it's true. Like, uh, Kansans aren't afraid of nothing. So, uh, hey, can we give it up for everybody who's watching uh, online today here in the room? Can we just say thank you? And then if you're watching online, you better be clapping for the people in this room today because it was uh, Armageddon outside. And so, uh, hey, uh, it's great to, great to see everybody. We're in the middle of a series uh, uh, just over the month of May, as uh, Brad talked about, uh, on mental health, emotional health, how it connects to our faith. And um, there's a word that's been gaining popularity in our uh, vernacular these days. It's a word that um, uh, is popping up everywhere. It's a word that actually my, my kids learned a couple of weeks ago right here at, at Heartland, uh, in Heartland Kids. And they came home and they had these um, super balls. You remember super balls? The little things you put like a nickel in the thing and you get it out and you bounce it and it always like takes one step forward and then bounce straight. The, you can never catch it. Uh, my, my son came uh, home and he was like exploring how a super ball worked. And, and I said, what you got there, man? He goes, this is what he says. He goes, I've got resilience. I said, resilience? He goes, yeah, I learned today at church that um, when life gets you down, you can bounce back up. I've got resilience. And I thought, maybe we all need to go to Heartland Kids because that's a really good sermon, right? Like, oh my goodness, that's, a, that's better than some of the stuff I say. My goodness, that's incredible. And so um, I just, I, I love that thought because um, I don't know if my son knew it or not, but I was planning on telling you guys about resilience a couple weeks later, and here we are today. And I thought, instead of a Super Bowl, you can't see a Super Bowl, but I got a basketball. And um, I, wonder, I wonder about you. Do you, have, do you have resilience? Resilience is a phrase that we love to use to talk about, um, well, other people, particularly sporting teams. If you're watching online and you're out of state, the next three minutes are not going to apply to you. But here in Kansas, we've got a couple sporting teams that we love that we would describe as resilient. You guys remember 2015? 2015. Here's, here's a, literally USA Today uses this headline, resilient Royals never gave up, never quit in World Series. I mean, come on, that's a great word to use, resilient, right? How about a, a little bit more recent memory, uh, 2022 back like January-ish, remember that 13 seconds left on the clock game? Oh my goodness. And uh, here's what the Chiefs said about themselves, resilient, it's the best way to describe this team. Or Maybe that was way too long ago and you're like maybe more recent memory. You're a basketball fan. There's another Kansas team uh, that did something amazing not too long ago. And uh, remember they were down by 15 points at half? Okay, all the K-State people forgot that. They're like, whatever, no big deal. All the Mizzou fans are like, ah. And yet if you're a KU fan, you're like, yeah, I remember. Resilient. It, it, here's, here's how it was described. It shows resilience, stages historic comeback for these. We love to cheer on resilience. In fact, I want to go on record and say, if you are a sports writer, please stop. Please stop using the word resilient to describe any team that has a comeback. Please. It's just an overused word in sports. But I think it's an underutilized word in our souls. Be, because uh, here's the thing about resilience. We love to, to sit by and cheer on resilience when we see it on a screen. But when we are the ones who have to exercise resilience, when, when we are the ones who actually have to demonstrate resilience, when we have to have the come from behind win, that's a different story, isn't it? It's, it's a little easier to watch the person on the screen who's just dribbling a ball and you're sitting there eating wings and say, come on, man. But when, when you're the one that's in the fight, it's a little harder. Resilience becomes a little tougher. And so uh, I think resilience is the thing that allows us to confront adversity in our lives and to keep going. R resilience is, is what uh, happens in our lives when, when we realize that we're up against it, so to speak, and we have to continue progressing it's easy in a sports field or in a stadium to know who's being resilient or not. The scoreboard literally tells you who's ahead and who's behind. In our own lives, though, it's really hard for us to ever feel like we're winning. I don't care how successful you are, what your resume looks like, you often don't know if you're succeeding or if you're, or if you're falling behind. And so all of us know a little bit about resilience because we all feel a little desperate at some point. We all feel like maybe there's more I could be doing, maybe there's more I should be trying. 
Resilience is something that you and I all know about. None of us feels dominant. None of us in our life feels like we're winning. I know this because I've asked, I've talked. As a pastor, I've, I've investigated, I've tried to get deep into the mindset of people who live here in Johnson County and in my, my own mindset. And I know that oftentimes we feel like there's more we could be doing. And so, so there's often this moment we feel like we're losing. What do you do when you feel like you're losing? Maybe I say it this way. The question before us today is how do you, how do you respond when life gets you down? How do you respond to the challenges that life throws at you? You had a setback in your career. Something happened that was totally outside of your control that now changed the trajectory of your career. How, how do you handle a tragedy that changed your family? How, how do you process a world that is ever being pulled apart in front of you? How do you have an experience of dissonance finally resolved with a diagnosis that will change and overshadow your life for a long time. How do you respond when life gets you down? During this month, uh, we're considering what it means to be mindful that our minds are full. We've already learned that um, in Jesus, he cares about our mental health and our emotional health because the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Right? That was a couple weeks ago. If you didn't catch that message, I'd love for you to go back and just check that out. Last Sunday, can we just give it up real briefly for Brad and Allison Herndon for this, the courage that it took for them to share their experience in life. One of the most remarkable conversations I've ever heard in a church. And so I, we heard that it, it's okay to seek help and to find avenues in which God would bring wholeness and, and to do that together as a couple, to do that in the context of a church and to do that in the context of a counselor. But um, today... I, I just want to ask you the simple question. I hope that today you walk out of here a little bit more mindful of what you do, you, what you do, how you respond when life gets you down. And one of the reasons we're even talking about this is because there's a misconception in Christianity. There's a misconception that maybe extends beyond that, that abounds in our society, that whenever it is that you feel the love of God, come into your heart and change your lives. The misconception is that that moment where you give God your life, you say, yes, I understand and I see it and I'm going to give you all that I am. The misconception is in that moment, everything starts to become better for you. I just am curious, has anybody ever had everything become better for you following Jesus? I mean, if all the, any church could ever acknowledge, like, it's hard. I mean, it's here at Heartland, an honest church, right? Isn't it hard when you follow Jesus, right? We're not an amen church, but I'd love to just know if I'm the only one there today. But is it hard to follow Jesus? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Thank you. The, the youngest amen I've ever gotten right there. Is, that's amazing. I love that. No, the misconception is that, you know, God is rich, and so you'll become prosperous, God is just, and so you're going to receive justice. But um, the testimony of history is that while living your life mindful of the resurrection of Jesus and the power that it brings with you, this life actually gets us down. One of the first followers of Jesus who, who went around telling people about the no longer dead Jesus was this guy named Paul. We know uh, a lot about Paul because of the letters that he wrote to the churches around the area that he went and traveled to and then left and then would write back to them to see how it was going or to encourage them. A lot of his writings are compiled in what's called the New Testament in our Bible. And, and one of the letters that Paul wrote to was a, a church at a crossroads in society. They were a Heartland-style church, the church in Corinth. And, and here's one of the things that, that the Apostle Paul, Super Saint Paul, said to these Jesus followers in Corinth uh, back early on in the Jesus movement. Here's what he said. He said, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. 
And that's really, um, I think, hyperbolic language, but I don't think Paul is being hyperbolic. I think he's being actually very literal. Paul uh, knew what it was to have stones thrown at him in order to kill him because he loved Jesus. Paul knew what it was to be put into chains and actually suffer persecution on account of the name of Jesus. This wasn't persecution like you had a fish in the back of your car and somebody flipped you off at the stop sign. You know, like American persecution. This was like legit life on the line, cost you something for believing in Jesus type thing. And, and so, so the cumulative effect on, on Paul's soul was this one idea, this one word, is that what he said, we are hard pressed. And what I want to say today to all of us is to recognize this. And if you're exploring Jesus, if you're wondering like what are the benefits of following Jesus, I want to give you the hard part first is that we in this life will be pressed. You got to know that. Like you kind of got to know that it's going to be hard, that, that, that we will be pressed. I've got a basketball here. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that, um, the reasons that I don't play basketball is because um, of this thing called the press. It's the most annoying defensive strategy known to humanity. Uh, most times when you're teaching kids how to play, there's even rules. You can't play basketball. You can't play defense uh, until the half court line. And the most decent sports, you know, uh, sportsmen uh, will, will actually like back up to the three point line before they start playing defense. In a full court press, the, uh, the defensive strategy changes. You start playing defense the moment that person can inbound the ball. You start waving your hands, trying to be obnoxious, kind of kick the ball away. Everybody tries to find a person and pretty much just beat them into the out-of-bounds line. If you've ever tried to break the press, it's really difficult. You have to have a well-organized strategy. You've got to have a bunch of confidence. You've got to have some quick passes. You've got to have a play. The press in life is what gets inside of your head. It's the fact that you want to make progress. You've got to get the ball over the line, but you can't get it. You can't find a passing lane. You can't get it over because the obstacles are too much. They're insurmountable and you don't know where to go. This, I think, is a great example or a great picture of what it feels like for us sometimes to follow Jesus. We, we, we all hate when we're pressed. But in the pressing... Paul tells us there's a positive side to being pressed in life. Is that when you're pressed, you get to find out how good you are on offense. Let me say it this way. You get to find out what's inside of you when obstacles are put in front of you. It, it's, like, um, it's like a toothpaste tube. You get to find out what's inside of it when you squeeze it. You know what I'm talking about. And, and this is us. The squeezing of life, the pressing of life reveals the character that's inside of us. And so Paul tells us that though he's pressed, he's not crushed. And it tells him that pressing has proven something about his character. When, when Paul says we're pressed but not crushed, that's Bible speak for the word resilient. There's something about our faith that when it gets worked out and the situations of life require me to either trust God or turn away, I get to see how strong my faith is in that decisive moment. I get to see how powerful faith in Jesus actually is. It's where the rubber meets the road of your faith in this life. And I think it helps me know that Paul was pressed. One of the most powerful testimonies last week from what Brad and Allison shared uh, was the number of people who sent us letters or had conversations with us in the, in the, in the atrium saying, gosh, if that person could find help. I can find help. And I think that's true about the Apostle Paul. If, if that guy feels pressed, then why wouldn't I feel pressed? If that guy feels crushed, then, then why wouldn't I feel crushed? There, there's some, somewhat of a normalization if a super saint like Paul could struggle in this life and find the pressing. It helps me know that, that, that Paul was pressed and that, I think, is actually the point. Let me back up just one sentence from what I just read to you, what, what, what Paul writes to this church in Corinth. Here's what he actually says. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God 
and not from us. Paul writes to the the Jesus followers in Corinth saying, we have the treasure of Jesus in our lives. It's like a treasure that is hidden in a jar of clay. The wider argument for Paul is that our faith works best in our weakness, not in our strength. And we see both feeling God's power. We, we, We see and we feel God's power and our frailty in our humanity. I don't know if you've ever um, struggled emotionally. If you've ever been depressed, if you've ever been anxious. Um, Statistics tell me that you have. Um, But whether we know or can pinpoint that is a different story. Does it comfort you to know that Paul himself says that his own life, his body, is like a jar of clay? It, it's this vessel that is one of the cheapest to make. It's the most inexpensive, one of the, just made from the dust, right? From, 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 the, from the, de- the, the dust of the ground, this, this clay. And it's shaped and it's molded into a, a usefulness. But you don't put treasures in breakable pots. I, I don't keep my passports hidden in a terracotta planter in my house. I have a safe with a key and a combination, and one day I'll get those biometric things so that, you know, they're really secure. I put valuable things where valuable things go, not where anyone can shatter and steal. And yet, Paul says that God delights in actually putting his strongest, most powerful gospel, the message of Jesus and the faith that he's no longer dead, into the hearts of people who are themselves like breakable vessels like clay. I I think our fragility is actually intended by God to do something huge. Because while we're all pressed, we all receive power. This is the part of following Jesus that I think is remarkable for us, particularly as we think about our emotional health, is that we will be empowered. Not just power. But in that verse, Paul says, all surpassing power, superpower, spirit power, highest octane transformative power for whatever life or the devil throws at you, empowered. This is what clay jars don't feel. They don't feel empowered. But there's this holding togetherness that God does that defies the natural structure of the vessel itself. That our faith is in the fact that God makes me, a dead soul, come alive. That that God made Jesus, who was physically dead, come alive. The proof for me that he does this in my life is actually the resurrection. Paul said earlier, we carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might also be carried in us. So um, how does this relate to our mental health? Well, our faith comes with a promise. I want you to see this. Your faith in Jesus comes with a promise that though you might feel like a fragile, chipping, cracked vessel, there's more power in you than you know. You have more inside of you than you realize. That the well of faith goes deeper than you could ever imagine. And sometimes more than you could ever feel. God cares so much about your emotional and mental health. He knew that we were going to bump up against the full court press of life. And so he wrote up some plays for us to, to break the press, so to speak. So that we could say life is hard, but we're not crushed. So, so that we could say... Uh, we are not destroyed and we are not forsaken. And I hope maybe you hear two things today about the faith that you have. And I hope that, that you hear this, that life in Jesus is really hard. It really is. It, is. it is not for the faint of heart. It is not for those who want some sort of easy life about them. It is difficult. But the second thing is this, is that God's made it such that you can do it. You can take step after step and know that when life pushes against you, 
that you have what it takes in God to keep taking the next step, no matter where it goes. God chose to use frail people like us to show the world how powerful he is. So, so God baked into the rhythms of our faith practices that are actually instrumentally helpful to building positive mental health. I want you to hear that again. God has actually made it such that our faith, when we walk it out, has natural consequences of it that improve your mental health. Now, that sounds like a really high claim for someone like me who did just study in theology uh, to make. And so actually, this past week, I sat down with a, a, a Heartlander, a fellow Heartlander, and someone who's a psychiatrist here in our community to talk about the natural rhythms of our faith that have a positive impact on our mental health and the cumulative effect of us just taking these natural steps of faith, just being Jesus followers, how they improve our emotional and mental health. And so I want uh, just to, to share with you that conversation. Take a look at the screen uh, as we watch this conversation between me and Dom Scalise. Dom Scalise, thanks for being with us uh, here today as we talk about our mindful series. Uh, you are no stranger to the mental health world. That's correct. What do you do? I'm a licensed psychologist. I have a private practice in town and uh, work with people trying to get better. That's awesome. And not only that, you're also a Heartlander. I am, yes. What was the first time you showed up at our building? Uh, 2007 is when yeah. we first showed up and then we had a kind of you know, wayward journey and found our way back at some yeah. point. So, Well, we're talking about this, uh, this, this topic of mental health, particularly that Jesus cares about our mental health. Mm -hmm. And as I talk to psychologists, I've gotten to know a bunch of counselors and myself kind of walk through that journey um, and, and growing in that. I, I've learned that one of the greatest things we can do for our own mental health is to pay attention to what a lot of people have called like the, the trinity of mental health, diet, exercise, and sleep that's yeah. my favorite one yeah um that that's got to be a lot of just some of the ways that we fall off the rails yeah i mean when when you get the question when people first come in very often it's like what can i do to get myself feeling better quickly you know and you know diet exercise sleep you know that is an easy sort of you know a religious uh, you know thing to offer anyone you know if we, we can look at any of those yeah. areas and practice better sleep hygiene for example look at diet you know and, and figure out you know is this right for you and consult with your you know, medical team to figure out if maybe there's some things you're not aware of that yeah. you need to, to cut back on well, I'd love to um, take that same approach to maybe following Jesus. Or, or is there maybe a, a triad that's similar uh, that, that comes out of our faith, that maybe following Jesus, putting Jesus first in our life, some of the practices that we have, um, do any of those have a positive impact on our mental health? If you could create like a spiritual mental health trinity, you know, outside yeah. the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but like the exercise, sure. diet, and sleep of our faith, what yes. would that look like? Thank you for asking me to revise the Trinity. Uh, that feels like a really easy thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, I mean, so within spiritual practices, right? So obviously prayer is a big one, right? And that's, we're talking about that all year long, uh, about the method of prayer. The research supports that there is a scientific benefit to prayer, meditative practices. Uh, we're, when we think about prayer, oftentimes you hear one thing, and prayer, as you know, is more than one thing, right? Sure. Praying on behalf of someone else, praying, looking inward, praying, you know, as a way to praise God, you know, there's many, many, many others. I saw a study that said there's something like 21 different flavors, you know, um, but it, you know, it, it helps improve your self-regulation after you've been in a meditative prayer, prayerful state, um, your focus, your attention, your concentration, uh, even things like memory, it looks like. Uh, so the positive impacts are pretty clear right at this point. Um, there's some controversial studies in there about, you know, prayer working for other reasons, you know, intercessory type of prayer, and that's a more complicated body of research. Yeah. Um, uh, but after that, um, things like social connection, you know, sure. friendship within sure. the church, um, outside the church too. Uh, there's um, Susan Pinker is a social psychologist. She has a whole an amazing book called The Village Effect which was designed to answer the question of why, originally, it was why do women live longer than men, which everywhere in the world, just about, you see that pretty significant difference, st statistically, that women are outliving men by years, you know, five to seven years, something like that. And so uh, she's curious about that, like, what's the difference? What is it that's happening here? 
and uh, she went to different cultures where men lived longer to see what was going on and there's a little island um, off of Italy, Sardinia, where she did some pretty outstanding research looking at how are these people living so long. And one of the things she found was just close social connections. Of course family, that's kind of a given, like if sure. you have family around taking care of you. Uh, but talking, you know, being open, um, you know, this is older research now, but as a family, one of the best things you can do uh, if you want your kids as adolescents to be happy, healthy, productive academically, um, uh, lower their risk for teen pregnancy is family dinner. Yeah, Talk where everybody's talking and talking, everybody's kind of right. enjoying a meal together. Right, so even though we love that. diet, you know, like yeah. eat the right stuff, it's yeah. like it kind of doesn't matter if you're having KFC. Yeah. Well, don't quote me on it. We're going to put, we're going to leave that in there. <laughs> yeah. It's like the talking, the engagement, the making sure that uh, you have relationships that are kind of being nurtured at the yeah. dinner table. And that's so crucial for, you know, community. Yeah. is the middle name of Heartland Church, mm -hmm. Heartland Community Church. That's right. And Jesus calls us to a new a new family. He calls us no longer um, enemies, but friends, no longer friends, but, but uh, co-heirs, right? So we're part of this family when we come to faith and, and there's this element of following Jesus where we become known at a deeper level uh, with one another. And so you're, you're telling me and you're telling us that the Jesus and me type of individualistic faith maybe is incomplete to a holistic mental health perspective. Like, if you're gonna walk out your faith, it's even better to do that in relationship with other people. Yeah, I think more complete, right? Sure. Um, the idea that, um, I would never say that having a good vertical relationship between you and God is not sufficient, right? I think we have yeah. like at least lots of stories about how uh, the early, you know, desert fathers, you yeah. know, did things like that and became hermits and whatnot. Okay. Uh, but I think, you know, more complete, like if you want a diversified emotional mental health portfolio, a spiritual portfolio that is maximizing returns, then absolutely. Yeah. So prayer yeah. has positive mental health benefits. Yep. Friendship, mm -hmm. sort of like being known by other people and knowing uh, other people and having them know you, right? Yep. Um, what would be the, what we would round out that triad? What's the third one? So service, serving others, yeah. uh, engaging in something that is sort of superordinate to the self. Yeah. And um, you know, there's lots of data that giving uh, to other people, time, and not just money, of course, time, yeah. um, being helpful to others, yeah. right? Which sort of supports the commute. The second piece of the Trinity here, you know, that there's a something that you can do. One of the things, you know, again, in the research on longevity, like one of the things that keeps people alive is not just being close with others, but then someone can see you're not feeling well and you call the doctor or say, you know what, you, you look depressed again, let's go back to the counselor. Uh, or our marriage isn't what it used to be. Um, let's, and, and that in and of itself is an act of service. Uh, I believe that a strong sense of purpose and meaning in life um, is a very important ingredient, you know, for, um, you know, a good balance mental health state. And so serving others, again, even if it's in your own family, you know, I think that that, I think the science shows that that is helpful uh, for what we're talking about here, having a, a good sense of self and a strong emotional mental health well-being. So, so prayer, friendship, and service all have this positive impact on our mental health. Just three things that are uh, pursuits that we all have because we uh, are exploring Jesus and want to see how it, how it is to live the Jesus first life or because we've been lifelong followers of him. But what's the other side of that? Like, is there another side? Yeah, well, of course, right? We all know that there's some darkness out there and I'm gonna call this the A-Holy Trinity, okay? The, okay, okay. <laughs> so we have uh, shame, you know, when yeah. we, uh, there's research on religiosity that say if you are preoccupied with right and sin and so preoccupied that that is what religion and spirituality is about, right? It induces this high level of shame. Mm -hmm. And um, a quick Google search, just like the you know the diet, exercise, sleep, seeing all the negative negative things associated with um, shame that gets stuck, right? Yeah, it's really central and core to a lot of the psychiatric issues that people come into my office with, they are they have a pool of shame yeah. keeping them from things like diet, exercise, sleep, but also prayer, 
friendship, close relationships, and of course, they're not going to show up to, to a serve event mm. uh, uh, very often. Uh, secrecy kind of goes mm. hand in hand there, right? So uh, these, you know, you can see how these are connected. Um, you know, just being in the dark. Um, uh, had coffee with some Heartland buddies. We were talking about men in caves, right? How yeah. uh, just being in the dark, you know, yeah. sometimes is comfortable in the wrong way at times, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, so secrecy can lead to, of course, a lot of problems. Mm. Um, and then um, loneliness, right? The research on loneliness says it's as bad or worse for you as smoking, right? A uh, pack of cigarettes a day or whatever. And so when, and this, this was a surprise. This is something that psychologists can get really yeah. proud of. It's like this data that says, if you don't deal with your loneliness, that's as bad or worse than being a smoker, right? On your longevity and subjective well-being. Uh, so those three, you know, of course, like if that's, this is really the big question that we kind of talked about earlier. It's like, I know the information, what's really keeping me from moving forward? Very often, the A Holy Trinity is in the way. Yeah, and so the way that actually you've already framed it for us, where if we take these spiritual practices of prayer, praying with and for other people, uh, friendship, knowing and being known by other people, and serving, uh, living a, your life in a way where you're caring for other people, it actually opens up the door for you to really defeat those three, uh, maybe maybe uh, adverse effects. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and to really pave the way. It happening. can, and there's, there's, there's a piece in there which is really perplexing, which is even for atheists. If you experimentally induce them and say you're in the prayer condition of this experiment, they too have some of those positive benefits, even without the internal belief system. That's incredible. That's cool. Don, thanks for your insights and for uh, just sharing your time with us today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. So, so, so three of them, prayer, connection, and service. Do those sound familiar? <laughs> One of the things that we are just so committed to as a church is to become holistic followers of Jesus. And that's why oftentimes we try and stay to the basics. So I don't know what your step is today. As you think about maybe the rhythms of your faith, when, when life has you down, which one of these practices can you just take one step in to build resilience? That's the question. Uh, it, maybe for you it's prayer. Maybe for you today you, you've got a lot of things weighing on you. You know what they are. I don't have to list out suggestions for you. You know what is pressing you today. And I wonder if, if, there's, a, if there's just a, a couple of minutes of prayer each morning that you can start your day with, just talking to God and saying, um, maybe, maybe this is what you'd say. You'd say, God, I am mindful that my mind is full and here's some of what I'm thinking about. And then talk to him. Just spend your, your, your five minutes in the morning over a cup of coffee just saying, God, I, I need the power in the midst of my frailty today. Help me keep going. Life's got me down. I need to bounce back up. Maybe for you, um, it's just simply an act of social connection. One of the things that Dom didn't say, or maybe we edited it out, was simply the fact that it doesn't have to be deep, bare your soul connections with people to help you receive the positive benefits of social interactions. Talking to the person at Aldi while you're checking out is a good way to have a social connection. Knowing your neighbors, or at least understanding who's coming and going or waving to them and saying, hey, I like your lawn. That's a positive social interaction, particularly on my street. You say, I like your lawn, it gets you in the door. Uh, and, and so one of the reasons why, like, you know, you go to church and maybe you, you feel, like, angsty about this, but one of the reasons we have you wave at each other is because it's a positive social interaction that helps you build Resilience. So, so maybe you come to, to Heartland and you just decide, I'm going to say hi and I'm going to talk to just one person today, whether it's over the coffee area or in the doors or by the kids area or, or even just here as I'm walking out, I'm going to say something to someone. Or, or maybe for you, it's, it's taking an hour of your week and giving it back to somebody else. Maybe it's finding a purpose in your life by giving and serving other people. Maybe for you, um, you don't know where to help other people. And so I just want to make a plug. 
One of the easiest ways to serve in Johnson County is right here at Heartland Community Church. We have so many ways for you to do something with your gifts, your experience, your, your expertise uh, for people outside of your family, both on-site as well as online opportunities. And it's just we know a way where if you take one step into serving other people, who knows what God would do in your own heart to help you grow healthier. You can find out more ways to do all that at heartlandchurch.org slash volunteer. As Brad said, there's a place for you here at this church to be able to give back. Here's how I want to conclude our service right here, right now. It's to realize the point of what Paul was writing to the, the Corinth church. To realize that this is not something that we do alone. We do this together. And I don't know if you missed it the first time I read it, but I just want to go back and read this sentence one more time and, and see the collective plural in what Paul is saying. He says to the church in Corinth, we, not I, but we are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. The way that we beat the press, the way we defeat shame and secrecy and isolation is by letting God's power work through us as we're seen by others. So friend, I just want to encourage you, take a step. Take a step. Uh, realize that um, when, when, life, when life has got you down, that you've got people, I just hit myself in the face. <laughs> you've got people that you can pass to. You, you've got people that you can, that, 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 that can get the ball from you. you you've, got, you've got people who are right here with you. They might punch you in the gut every once in a while, but you'll get it back. We do this together. Your growth is our problem. And there's more in you. There's more love in you from God than you know. So church, I can't wait to continue this series next week as we talk about how to fight with God. But my prayer for you today is that you would know the love of God that has been poured into your life, jars of clay that we are, so that the world might see that this power that we have is from God and not from ourselves. Harlan Church, this week, go be resilient. We'll see you next week.